Hello programmers and welcome to CircuitPython School. I'm Professor John Gallagher and this is a series for the absolute beginner where we'll learn to code in CircuitPython using the Adafruit Circuit Playground Blue Fruit. And in this jam-packed video we'll learn to create programs in Moo and save them to our microcontroller. We'll use the print function and work with the serial monitor. We'll light up our board, controlling its colorful built-in LED lights by importing and using libraries that extend the Python programming language. We'll create a variable that holds an object created from a class. We'll execute an object's method to light up all of the lights in a selected color. We'll learn about colors formatted as RGB values. And we'll also have a series of exercises and solutions to change the colors from red to blue, purple, orange, and aqua. So let's learn big! Now in earlier videos in this playlist, we set up our CPB with CircuitPython, we loaded in the libraries that we're going to be using, and we installed the Moo software. Now if you haven't done that yet, go back to the start of the playlist for step-by-step -step instructions. But for everybody who's ready, make sure you've plugged in your CPB, you should see it mounted on your computer with the name CircuitPy, and start up Moo! and you'll see that there's a tab in the upper left-hand corner labeled Untitled. That means we're creating a new document. Now line one has a pound sign and says, write your code here. Now the pound sign is a comment character in Python. It means ignore everything that comes after this pound sign or hashtag character. Don't execute it. So pound signs in Python are a great way to document your program. So why don't we highlight the text after the pound sign, delete it, and write our first comment. So we'll write, this is my first CircuitPython program. And this is my first comment line. Now the next thing we're going to do underneath that is we're actually going to program. We're going to type a print statement. This is all in lowercase, but we'll start by typing slowly, P and then R, and then notice what happens. This here is code completion, this little box that pops up. Moo is showing you keywords that it knows start with the letter P, R, print and program. What Moo is doing is it's offering to complete typing for me. Now there's no reason why I can't type in P, R, I, N, T, and I usually do, but I can also use the down and up key to highlight the different words that Moo was suggesting. I'm gonna highlight the word print, then press return, and Moo types in the rest of that phrase for me. Now sometimes this can help you enter code more quickly, it can prevent spelling mistakes, and it can even serve as a kind of help because it'll let you know keywords that begin with letters you type in case you forget the full name of the word that you wanna use. Now this word print here is a function. Typically, when we have a function to tell Python to do something, in this case, we want it to print something out, we start things off with an open parenthesis and we end it with a closed parenthesis. Now, as soon as I type an open parenthesis, I get a yellow box down here that reminds me of what this particular statement does. It's a little bit of pop-up documentation. Sometimes this will be useful to refer to, but right now we're just gonna ignore it. Now, inside the parentheses, we'll put any stuff the function needs to do its job. And in this case, we'll put in the text that we want to print. Now, text to print goes in between a set of double quotes. So I'm going to type in, double quote, I just wrote my first CircuitPython program, exclamation point, close double quote. Then let's finish that off with a close parenthesis, and you'll notice that Moo has added color to my code. Comments are in gray, keywords print in blue, and the text that I've typed in, including the double quotes, is in red. By the way, programmers refer to text like this as a string, as in a string of characters, and this code highlighting is really useful, because over time you'll get used to how code should be highlighted, and if the color seems off, that's an indication that your program might have an error. By the way, if you prefer dark mode and a different code coloring scheme, you can click on the theme button up here, and that'll cycle you through any of the styles that Moo offers. But I'll cycle back and keep mine as this default. And now notice up here in the upper left hand corner, this tab has a red dot next to it. Now that red dot means that we have unsaved changes, which is correct since we haven't saved anything. So I'm gonna click on the save button. Since I haven't saved anything yet, I see the save as dialog box here. Now if you have your CPB plugged in, you should see it mounted on your computer just like a flash drive. And it should be named CircuitPy. If for some reason it doesn't appear, you can try unplugging and plugging the device back in. You can also click the reset button in the middle of the CPB once, not twice. If the lights in the CPB turn green, you click it too many times, so just click it once again. But hopefully you don't need to do any of that because the CircuitPy volume is showing. And whenever we save a program to our CircuitPy volume, we're going to name that program code.py, all lowercase. Now that might seem weird. You never name all of your word processing files with the same name. But microcontrollers like the CPB only execute one program at a time. And when it finds a file named code.py, when it restarts, that's the program it's going to run. Now, technically, you could save the file with some other names, main.py, code.txt, or main.txt. CircuitPython can execute files with those names too. But if you only use code.py, you'll never be confused because you've got multiple files on there with names that could execute and you're not sure which one's executing. And code.py is also the name that you'll find used in most of the tutorial examples you'll see online. 
So with the file named code.py, all lowercase, click save. Now as part of the installation, a code.py file might have already been created on your CPB, but if it is, just click on replace. And again, we don't see anything, but I want you to click on this serial button in the toolbar. And what this does is it opens up a window on the bottom of our screen, and this is called the serial console. Sometimes you'll hear it called the serial monitor. Now the serial console will give you information on whether your program has any errors, and it also acts as a window where your board can send data back to Moo for you to look at. Now one way the board can send data back to the serial console is by using the print command. So now with the serial monitor showing, we're going to click on the save button again. This restarts the CPB, executing code.py right from the beginning, and whoa! It says, I just wrote my first CircuitPython program, and you did! Do a happy dance! Now let's modify some of that code. We'll highlight the word first here. We'll delete that. We'll type in the word second. And now notice in the upper left-hand corner, code.py has a red dot on it again. And that means that we have unsaved changes. And indeed there are because we just changed a word in our code. So let's click on the save button. This saves to the CPB. It runs the code right from the beginning. And whoa, we see the line down here in the serial monitor says, I just wrote my second CircuitPython program. Nice work. Now, every time you click on save, you save code.py onto your microcontroller, and that code starts executing again right from the start. Now, let's say you want to make a backup of your code, and you want to save it onto your computer. Well, what you can do is just double-click on the tab up here where it says code.py. Now, that opens up the standard Save As dialog box, and you can save this wherever you want to on your computer, and you can give it a new name. So I'm going to head over to my desktop. I'm going to create a new folder called CircuitPython School, where I'm going to save all of my files in this series, and I'll give this file a name. I'll call it simple-print, then click the Save button. And now I've got a version of this program saved onto my computer desktop. Now, there's still code.py on my CPB, but I've got this version here on my computer. So if you're doing this video as part of a course and your instructor asks you to submit your code, what you'll want to do is double click on the tab, save the program to your computer using a name that you can recognize, maybe save it with a name your instructor told you to use, and then turn that file in. Now, here's something else that's important to understand. This file that I just saved, simple-print, is on my computer. It's on my Mac. It's not on my CPB. So if I want to go back and execute the code on my microcontroller, then I've got to resave the code as code.py on my CPB. So I'll double click on the file name in the tab, simple-print. I'm going to find my CircuitPy volume, click to select that so that I know that I'm saving my file there. And then I'm going to either type in code.py, or if you're using a Mac, you can do what I'm doing here. Just click on the name that's grayed out, and that file name automatically is entered as the file name. Then click Save, and you're asked if you want to replace the file on disk, because there's already a code.py there. I'm going to select Replace, and it executes our code again. We see a little jump in the bottom of the serial monitor, and it says, I just wrote my second CircuitPython program. Well, that's good work printing, but one of the fun things to do in physical computing is actually make things light up. So let's write a program to light up the ring of 10 10 lights that are around our CPB. First, let's highlight and delete the program that we've just written. And then after the pound sign, I'm going to put in the comment that says, light it up. And now we're going to enter some lines of code. And these three lines of code that we're going to enter are three lines that you can use anytime you want to work with the 10 built-in lights that are on your CPB. Now, the first line we're going to write is import board. Now, Python itself doesn't know about the features of our CPB microcontroller. But by saying import board, we extend the CircuitPython language so that it has statements and capabilities to work with this board. In fact, import board has information on any of the boards that can run CircuitPython. So if we use another board like an Arduino Nano RP2040 or a Native Fruit Feather board, the board library knows what that board can do. And we'll explore this more in a future video. Now below that, we have the statement import NeoPixel. That's also all in lowercase. Now this statement adds additional features into the Python language so that we can work with and control NeoPixel lights. Now NeoPixel is Adafruit's term for a certain type of LED light that can shine in any color. There happen to be 10 of these NeoPixel lights built into the CPB. Some boards have one NeoPixel light, some don't have any, and the board library knows which boards have lights and how to connect to them. But even if we were working with a strip or strand of NeoPixel lights that was connected externally to the board, you'd still import NeoPixel because this library has all of the commands we need to work with NeoPixel lights. Now in the line below that, we type in pixels, all lowercase, and an equal sign. Now pixels is the name that we're using to refer to the group of 10 lights that are on our CPB. And after the equal sign, we'll put in the code that we use to set up and configure those lights. Now we don't have to call these lights pixel. We could use any name. We could call our lights Jennifer or Lady McLightface. But pixels is a good name. You'll see a lot of examples that use the name pixels, so we'll use it here. Now this name pixels is what programmers refer to as a variable. 
It's a variable because we can make changes or vary the contents of the data inside. And we'll do this in later videos where we do things like changing the brightness of the lights. And if it helps you, you can think of a variable as a sort of box that holds data. And anytime we use the name pixel, we can get at the contents of that box. Now after the equal sign is where we set up the contents of that box named pixels. And we just have to do this once at the start of our program. So we do that by typing neopixel dot all lowercase and there are no spaces before or after the dot. And notice that this word neopixel is spelled the same way with the same capitalization as our import neopixel statement up here. Now what we're saying is go into that neopixel library that we just imported. Now the dot says refer to a special capability of the neopixel library. And after that dot, we type in the word NeoPixel again, but very important, it has different capitalization. It's all one word with a capital N and a capital P, and it's important to get that capitalization right because if you get it wrong, your code won't work. Now writing NeoPixel this way says, hey, go into that NeoPixel library and use this NeoPixel blueprint spelled this way. It's defined in the library, and that's used to set up a bunch of lights that we can control in our program. Now in computing, we refer to the blueprint to set something up like this as a class. Now after this class, we'll add parentheses and we'll pass in any values that the blueprint needs in order to set up the lights. Now in this case, we're gonna pass in four values separated by commas. First is board, lowercase, dot, and in all capitals, NeoPixel. Now this means go into the board library and find that unchanging spot where we can refer to the built-in NeoPixels. By the way, Python is super fussy about getting capitalization right, but this can confuse new students because we have some words that are in all caps, some that are in mixed caps, and some that are in all lowercase. Well, the reason for that is there are different conventions or styles that programmers use for different types of data or data structures. So briefly, the standards are any values that are supposed to be unchanged and remain constant should be written in all capital letters. So since this refers to NeoPixel lights that are permanently on our NeoPixel board and they can't be changed, the name NeoPixel that you see here is written in all caps. Another convention is to write class names like NeoPixels here as one word, but with a capital letter at the start of each of the sort of words inside of the word, like capital N Neo, capital P Pixels. That's referred to as the upper camel case style, since the capital letters look sort of like the humps of a camel. Now you'll also notice the convention is for variables like pixels or function names like print to be written in all lowercase letters. And if a variable has more than one word in it, like auto write here, the convention is to use an underscore to separate the words. And that style is called snake case. Now after board.neopixel, we put in a comma and we're gonna put in the number 10. That's because we have 10 neopixels or LED lights built into the CPB. If we were using an external light strip that had 30 lights, we'd put a 30 in here. Then after the comma, there's another property, brightness, all lowercase equals, and we're gonna set that to 0 0.5. That means set the brightness of these lights to 50%. 1.0 would be 100% brightness. Then comma, and then the word auto underscore write, all lowercase, equals true, and that true has a capital T. Again, make sure that you spell this correctly with the correct capitalization. This just means that after we make changes of the group of lights named pixels, those changes should take immediate effect, writing the changes to our lights so that we see the changes right away. Now for a new programmer, that might seem like a gnarly bit of code, but here's the good thing. As long as you're working with the CPV, and this code also works with the Circuit Playground Express, if you want to set up and start working with those 10 lights on the board, you can copy and paste this code into any program and it'll be good to go. It's almost like working with a software Lego. So now let's head back to Moo and type in exactly what we saw in the previous slides. Import board, import NeoPixel. I'll give myself a little line for spacing. Then pixels equals lowercase NeoPixel dot NeoPixel with a capital N and a capital P. Open parentheses. And then I'll type in my four arguments, lowercase board dot in all caps NeoPixel, comma 10, comma brightness equals 0 0.5 comma auto underscore right equals capital T in true and then close parentheses. Now here's an important point about Python. It's very particular about spelling, capitalization, spaces. You wanna make sure that you don't have any extra spaces in there. Your parentheses are important. There should always be a matching close parenthesis for every open parenthesis. Even the indentation of your code is important and we'll see that in later examples. So if Python is expecting your code to be formatted and spelled in a particular way, and if it's not, then your code won't work. So it's super important to be extra detail oriented whenever you're entering code. So now these first three lines we've entered are all about the setup. Now to get the lights to do something, we're gonna type in this line. Now this line says, go into those lights that we just referred to as pixels, all 10 of them, and fill them with a color. The pixels part says, hey, those are our 10 lights. 
remember we set this variable up with this line up here. We only need to do that once at the start of our program. The dot fill is a special command. Programmers refer to this as a method. This method will fill in the lights that we refer to in the left hand side. So those are all of our pixel lights. And in between the parentheses, we specify a color. Now there's another set of parentheses and we have three numbers in there. Those numbers represent the red, green, and blue mix of colors that we'll use to fill in our lights. Now by mixing different quantities of red, green, and blue, we can produce just about any color in the spectrum. Now the way we're gonna represent colors is in between these parentheses, we'll have three numbers from zero to 255. Zero means no color, 255 means as much of that color as possible. So what we're showing here with 255 in the first position, the red position is make that fully red, and then the green is zero and the blue is zero. So this is gonna light up all of our lights as red. So when we press on the save button after entering this line, our code's gonna be saved, it'll start executing again from the beginning, and all 10 lights on our CPB are gonna turn red. So now let's return to Moo and enter that line. So on our new line, we'll type in pixels dot fill open and close parentheses. And inside those parentheses, we'll put a new set of open and close parentheses. That's what you've got to do whenever we represent a color. And we'll type in 255 comma zero comma zero. That's red. Then keep an eye on your CPB while we click on our save button and whoa, what happened so fast you might have missed it. But the lights flashed in red really quickly and then they went out. What went on here? Well, what happened is the program started executing from start to finish, and when it was done, the lights shut off. The program isn't running anymore. Let's try to fix that, and we'll fix that by getting our program to continue to stay on by repeatedly executing statements over and over again after we've turned on the lights. Now, most of the time when we write CircuitPython code, we want a portion of our code to run continuously, waiting for some input, maybe a button to be pressed, or to read a sensor. So we'll create a piece of our program to repeat forever and not stop unless we stop the program or cut power to the CPB. Now we call this constantly repeating part of our program an infinite loop, since it will loop or repeat itself over and over again until it's stopped. Now the most common way to write an infinite loop is with this statement, the word while, all lowercase, followed by the word true with a capital T, then a colon. Now the while statement checks to see if any condition after this while word is true. Now in the future you might see some code with some math in here that evaluates a statement that could be true or that could be false. And if it's false, it won't perform the code that's indented after the while statement. But by saying while true, we say while true is true, which sounds weird, but since true is always true, we perform all the code that's indented after the while true forever and ever and ever. Now when we press return, look what happens. Moo indents this line. It actually indents it by a tab or by four characters. The indent is very important. Any lines of code indented at this level will repeat forever and ever inside the while true loop. And once we end any indented lines, we loop back to the very first line following our while true statement and repeat that. Now right here, I'm gonna write just one line of code and that's simply the word pass. Now this is a placeholder command, it does nothing. We need to have at least one statement under our while true in order for our program to work. So use pass in your code when a statement is required, but you don't wanna perform any additional logic. So with our serial monitor open, let's take a look at what happens when we save. And hey, the CPP lights up in red and it stays red. Now you might be wondering, hey, what do I need to do in order to stop this from executing? One thing we can do is click down here in the serial monitor, hold down the control key and press C. Control C stops the code from executing, it enters a break. Our program is no longer running and if you scroll up, you can see the line number where we stopped our program. Here it says line 10, which makes sense because that's the line in our infinite loop where we repeat over and over again. Now you'll also see a message down here that says you can press any key to enter the REPL, that's R-E-P-L. That's pronounced REPL and it stands for Read, Evaluate, Print Loop. So if you press any key, you'll see a prompt with three greater than symbols, and this follows information about your current CircuitPython version and the board that you're using. Now the REPL can be used to enter and execute commands one at a time instead of having to write and run a whole program. We'll learn more about the REPL in a future video, but for now, let's get out of the REPL, and we can do that, it says right up here, by typing in Control D, and what that does is it restarts the execution of our code right from the beginning, and that's why we see the CPB light up in red again. So now that we've got this working, why don't we try a few challenge problems? And in the first one, why don't you light up your CPB with just blue lights? So why don't you pause, give this a shot, and when you're done, let's resume the video, and let's see, did you get this right? All you needed to do was to change the color from 255.00 to 0, 0,0, 255. That's no red, no green, but full on blue. Save this, and indeed, the CPB lights up in blue. Now here's another problem. 
how would you light the CPB up with purple lights? So pause, give that a shot. And when you resume, let's take a look. One thing that you could do is you could mix the colors. So purple is a mix of red and blue. I'm going to try 255, 0, 255. Now you might like this purple, but if you want to experiment with different values, you certainly could do that to try to make the purple look lighter or darker. And for the last challenge, why don't you search online to see if you can change the color to orange and then write another program to change the color to aqua. So pause, give this a shot, explore online resources, see what you can come up with, and resume. Let's see how you did. And if you pull up a browser, you can search for RGB colors. One of the first links is this RGB colors chart, so let's click on that. And we see a chart filled with colorful squares. And if I find an orange one that I like, I can just hover my cursor over it. I see this one here has the color 255, 128, 0. So why don't I try that out? And I see that it doesn't match up perfectly with what I thought I saw on screen, but I can experiment with different values. I'm going to try to tone down the green value to just 64. Save that. That looks much more orange to me, so you might find that you experiment with some of the colors that you find initially online. By the way, I've noticed that the version of Moo that I'm using seems to intermittently shrink the font, but if you hold down Shift-Command-Plus on the Mac, every time you press Shift-Command-Plus, that will increase the font size. Well, what about our Aqua? I'm going to search for RGB Aqua. I see this first link here, and this link suggests that I could get Aqua from 0, 255, 255. I'll give that a shot, save it out. And hey, that looks pretty good. So this was a longer video, but we had some big learning in here. We learned how to write a program using Moo, how to save and execute a CircuitPython program on a microcontroller. We learned how to use the print command and the serial monitor, how to save a backup copy of our work on our computer, how to import libraries so that we can extend CircuitPython with new capabilities, and we use the board and the NeoPixel libraries. We created a variable to hold an object created from a class. That was our pixel object created from the NeoPixel class. We learned about RGB colors and how to look these up online. And we learned how to create an infinite loop with while true, how to interrupt that loop with control C, and how to restart the execution of our code using control D. So you're really building some CircuitPython skills there, programmer. There's lots more to come. Keep at it.